Hey, hi, Mark Rizat here, uh, acting coach to opera singers based in Manhattan, freelance all over the world via Skype. Check out my webpage. I'm doing a series of insights into characters in opera that frequently present problems for people. They're difficult to understand, figure out their motivation, why they say and do what they do. Today we're looking at the Queen of the Night from Mozart's Magic Flute. And I was inspired with a very intelligent singer that I was working with the other week. And I started out saying, do you like the Queen of the Night? And she said, whoa, that's a loaded question. And um, I agree. It is a loaded question because what's to like about somebody who seems to be a liar and a be, seems to be a manipulative person, seems to um, have no thought for anything except what it is that she wants and is willing to have other people commit murder kidnapping, um, revenge for her. So uh, the thing that I do is I don't make up an opinion about these people. I always source the text and the music and I put together what people say because your character is defined by the words that come out of your character's mouth. There's no two ways about it. So I'm not going to speculate here. I'm just going to tell you something that you probably don't know because the score of Magic Flute is, it's a dialogue opera, much like Fledermaus, but I would not call it an operetta. Um, and so this uh, Zingspiel has a lot of dialogue and um, if you're performing the opera in German, that's a lot of dialogue to do in German or even if you're doing it in English. So it inevitably gets cut so that we can move the story forward. But Bigby's a dialogue that gets cut almost all the time uh, is in the second act. And it's a scene between the Queen of the Night and Pamina. Okay, maybe if you're doing the role, you're familiar. She, um, Pamina's been kidnapped by Sarastro, who is the head priest of an order of men. And she sent Tamino, the queen, to rescue Pamina and bring her back and um, then she says he can marry her and that's what goes on in the first aria. She's leaving an awful lot of stuff out that uh, she cherry picks just to get done what she wants done which is Tamina, rescue my daughter and you can marry her. She's a lot more clear in the second act when Pamina asks her essentially but why these seem to be such good, peaceful men, why do you want revenge on them? Not remembering that Pamina has already heard Sarastro say things like, your mother is a proud woman, and without a man to lead a woman, they fall off the path of righteousness. Uh, we heard the speaker say to Tamino, um, a woman does very little, um, and chatters a great deal, and he calls him youth or boy. You actually believed her tongue game. So it's very insulting to women. And I frankly think in this age of hashtag me too, we got to understand what was going on at the time. So without getting too historical and boring, um, this time around Mozart, which is, let's not forget, the time of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, this was called the Age of Enlightenment. And basically what it was about was that various writers like um, Voltaire, who wrote Candide, and uh, Diderot and Rousseau, their ideas were simply stated, the individual needs to decide what's right and wrong for himself and not to just obey the rules set down by the state or the church. And very briefly, like Dr. Pangloss in Candide in the operetta by Leonard Bernstein, Dr. Pangloss is this character who says everything is best in this best of all possible worlds. And his followers like Candide and Cunegonde believe him Simp and, and the whole book is about Candide, Cunegonde, everybody figuring out for themselves what actually is right. Okay, so here's the Queen of the Night in Mozart's Age of Enlightenment, a time in which women were recognized as being equal to men, where women were actually encouraged to be educated, 
They got degrees in law and medicine. And then sort of the dark age of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s came along and people started working in factories and the woman's place was in the home. Well, the woman's place in the home goes back to the 1950s in this country because up through the Second World War, women in America were pretty much kept at home. Uh, don't forget Lucy, Lucille Ball on I Love Lucy is always trying to get into the act and Ricky wants her to stay home and take care of the apartment and the, the baby. Leave it to Beaver was about Mrs. Cleaver staying home and cooking dinner in a dress, nylons, high heels, pearl earrings, and a sweet little apron. Well, in the 60s, people like Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan came along, and they upended the whole idea that a woman's place is in the home. A woman is inferior somehow to a man. And so through oh, bra burning and Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, women really pushed the idea that women are second-rate citizens way, way over to a whole other direction that has yielded us, well, the squad and uh, hashtag Me Too and the Women's Wa March on Washington back uh, after a recent inauguration. So uh, I'm looking at how the queen comes to want vengeance, murder, kidnapping to be done for her sake. In this dialogue in Act Two, when Pamina asks her about why, she tells her, and I'm going to read the dialogue to you. She says, the queen says, Dear child, your mother can no longer protect you. With your father's death, my power went to the grave as well. Your father willingly gave the sevenfold sun circle to the priests. This mighty sun circle Sarastra wears on his heart. As I discussed with your father, with furrowed brow he spoke to me thus, Woman, my last hour is at hand. All my treasure which I alone possess are yours and our daughters. The all-consuming sun circle, I asked him hastily, is allotted to the dedicated ones, he answered. Sarastro will manfully wield its power, as I did before. And now not another word. Seek not after wisdom which is incomprehensible to a woman's mind. Your duty is to turn over your obedience to wiser men. Okay, stop. Chances are pretty good you're a woman interested in the Queen of the Night, right? How do you feel about a man telling you that a woman's mind can't comprehend certain wisdom that only men can comprehend? I mean, if I were a woman, I'd hit about high, five high Fs right then and there. So, so Pamina's father was head priest like Sarastro, and she, the queen, believes, obviously, that they shared power as husband and wife, as queen of the night, which is... Let's face it, I mean, that's a pretty powerful mythological role to have. And her husband was the head of this order of priests, this cult, this religious order. So misguided as it may be for the queen to want Pamina to actually stab Sarastro, I cannot say that I actually blame her anger for how she and women are being treated. I rather admire the fact that she is so enormous in her reaction to the way she's being treated. And I absolutely believe that she is convinced that she's right and that other people, when you're queen or president, um, you delegate work to other people because you're in charge. And I think people do say what they believe to be right. And I think the first aria, Otsitz Vanisht, is the same as the second aria. It comes from a diff different po uh, emotional point of view. But persuading Tamino that her daughter was abducted and she was terrified and that the queen herself couldn't do anything about it, which I don't quite know how Tamino takes that, but he's young and he's naive and he believes it. 
And then telling her daughter that if she doesn't do what she wants her to do in the second aria, she will abandon her, cut off all ties of motherhood. Um, we had to be pushed in the 60s by people like Gloria Steinem. Um, New York had a congresswoman named Bella Abzug, Betty Friedan, as I said, just like in Mozart's time, people like Rousseau and Diderot and Voltaire were writing and saying, essentially, use your head, think for yourself. In the 60s, if you're a woman, burn your bra, demand equal pay, demand equal recognition. You know, back in the 60s, there was a, a, a cigarette ad and uh, its catchphrase was, you've come a long way, baby. These cigarettes targeted uh, the woman's audience. And we have come a long way, baby. And what happened in the 60s has produced the hashtag Me Too movement. What happens with the queen is, is that she pushes her daughter into thinking for herself. She pushes her daughter into reasoning that she isn't just Princess Barbie who is going to marry the handsome prince and live happily ever after. She gets the daughter to understand she can't kill Sir Roster, so she tries to kill herself. That instead of killing herself, she needs to go to Tamino and help him through the trials. So rather than a force of evil, I regard the queen as the catalyst that releases forces of good in her daughter and in what will be her future son-in-law, Tamino. Sorry about the edit, little technical glitch. So my question to the singer, to wrap this up, do you like the Queen of the Night? And her answer of, boy, well, that's a loaded question. Yes, it is a loaded question. You don't necessarily have to like the person that you're pretending to be but you certainly do have to understand where they're coming from. And that involves really looking at the libretto, reading the words that they say, and having a think about what would motivate somebody to behave like this. So thanks for watching. And um, if you'd like to work on this aria with me or any other aria, song, uh, monologue from a play or a music theater piece, get in touch with me at my webpage, www.markforzat.com. Looking forward to the next insight. Take care. Thank you. Bye.